Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, Evan Edward Lane, author of Arlen Specter, Scandals, Conspiracies, and Crisis in Focus. Evan Edward Lane is the author of Arlen Specter, Scandals, Conspiracies, and Crisis in Focus. Uh, why did you write this book? Well, I'm the director of the Arlen Specter Center over at Thomas Jefferson University, and we recreated the senator's office in Washington. And one of the highlights of the of the office is all these pictures that Specter took with world leaders. So I would have to give the tour. People would always say the same thing: "Who's that? What's going on? What happened?" And I said to myself, you know, that would make a really interesting book as to who's there and why it happened. And as I delved into it, um, I'm a New Yorker, you probably could tell within five seconds, and I really didn't know much about All Inspector. But as I started preparing to answer these questions on who is this, why are they there, why is Spectre with them, I soon learned that Spectre was involved in the middle of some of the most important historical moments in history. And I said, this would be a good idea for a book. So that's how I started writing it. How did the Arlen Specter Center end up with his uh, photographs? Well, Specter was a neighbor, and he knew uh, the presidents of Philadelphia University then, before we merged with Jefferson. And he lived like three blocks away, and they were friends. And uh, it was really between them that he gave. He said, it's, I'd like to have my library with your university. And when we saw that it was 2,300 boxes of material, we soon decided we have to partner with the University of Pittsburgh because there's no way we could handle something. So we started this partnership with the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, the center is in Thomas Jefferson University, and the archives we partner with the University of Pittsburgh. So that's how it started, really, with a friendship between uh, President Spinelli of our university and, and the senator. Uh, what types of events does the center run? Well, every week, even with COVID, we run a thing called roundtables. Uh, the All Inspector Center has, is an old building that Casper Wistar uh, lived in. If you ever heard of the um, plant Wisteria, he's the one who uh, cultivated it, also the Wistar Institute. And this was his summer house. So we redid the house, and we have a beautiful living room with a fireplace. And we, I get together with other faculty, mostly students. We drink coffee, we eat cookies, and we talk about everything in an in environment which is safe, where we debate, but in a, in, a, uh, in a respectful way, every single issue. So we do that every week. Uh, we also had major events. Uh, we recently had um, the future of Roe versus Wade. We invited a lawyer from uh, Klein Law School to talk about it, a physician from uh, Jefferson, and a sociologist from Rutgers to talk about it. So we also held um, is football um, ethical in light of head injuries? And we had um, Governor Rendell uh, represented the typical football fan. So we have big events and we have the roundtables uh, almost every week to discuss everything you can imagine. So when you re received this huge collection of memorabilia from, from Senator Specter, uh, what was involved in cataloging it and figuring out what was there? Oh, God. Um, there was so much. Uh, and that's where we had actually hire an outside archivist to go through it. Uh, we had to take actual items like his photos, um, monuments, statues, and of course all of his all of his papers. He kept everything, and this was a four-year uh, type of. Um, gargantuan uh, job, but we work together with the University of Pittsburgh. We now have a terrific website, which is organized with all the different topics. Uh, a lot of it's been digitalized, and a lot of it you can get. And the center was involved in every, every possible thing, uh, from mental health to uh, LBGDQ rights to uh, Iran-Contra. So there's just so many different things that he played a major role in that it took a long time to make sure we covered absolutely everything and what his role was in it. How did you decide which photos to include in the book? Well, I'm the author. It's the one I liked. Uh, it's the one that uh, people mostly pointed to. Uh, it all started, uh, the photo that was most popular was a photo of Spectre with Yasser Arafat. 
and they were in Spectre's office, and Spectre was not a fan of Yasser Arafat. Spectre was Jewish, a uh, big support of Israel, and Yasser Arafat, of course, um, Palestinian, and many would think that he was a terrorist, and so they were responsible for the uh, Munich Games massacre, um, the um, Mr. Klinghoffer being thrown off a ship, new, numerous other terrorist uh, uh, debacles. And Spectre did not like him, but he realized soon that whether you like somebody or not, um, if they are an important person in the world stage, you have to talk with them. You have to deal with them, because not talking to them is going to lead to the obvious answer of, of fighting. But if you talk, there's always a chance of um, a negotiation. And this, was, this picture was of Specter and Arafat, and behind Arafat is a poster of Clinton and Arafat. Um, saying a free Palestine, and it looked like a campaign poster, and it was in Specter's office, and obviously it was a put-together thing. Clinton never campaigns with Arafat, but it looked like Clinton supported Arafat. So when uh, Specter was in Israel with Clinton, as a matter of fact, he saw this poster everywhere. It was, it was omnipresent. So he bought it and he put it in his office. Now, Arafat is visiting Washington, D.C. And it comes out that he is about to violate the Oslo Agreement, which is the peace agreement between the Palestinians and Israel. And one of the most important things is that the Palestinians cannot declare free state on their own. But he was going to do that. So Specter wanted to talk to him, brought him into his office. And the situation was chilly, as you can expect. Arafat then looks behind and sees there's the poster, and they become just two guys. And he says, hey, I love that poster. And uh, Spectre says, yeah, I, I enjoy it too. And they took a picture in front of the poster, and the most amazing thing is there's Arafat with his arm around Spectre like buddies. Here were these two people that you thought would never, ever talk to each other, but he had his arm around him like friends, two big smiles, and then they sat down in Spectre's office. And they worked out an agreement where Arafat would not uh, uh, say that there's going to be a free Palestine. He would not violate the Oslo Accords if Specter would agree to say on the Senate floor that Arafat was being reasonable, which he did. So I love that picture because it shows the philosophy that Specter had throughout his career that even if you disagree with someone, whether it's Assad, which he visited all the time, or Castro, uh, even if you disagree with their philosophy, if you sit down and talk to somebody, there is always a chance that you can work things out. And that was the first uh, picture, because most people said, what is this smiling? It's just so unlikely. And that's the picture that really turned me on to writing the book, because it's the story behind the story on what happens in world events when people sit down and decide to uh, be intelligent with each other as opposed to antagonistic. How often did he meet with Arafat? Several times. Um, he met with Arafat in, um, in Palestine, um, in West Bank. Uh, to talk about a very important issue was whether or not um, the Palestinians would remove the destruction of Israel from their manifesto. Uh, Arafat had, on many occasions, promised that he would, but he did not, eventually. And, and Spector did put a lot of pressure on him to do that. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we know one thing, um, if you don't sit down with somebody, if you don't try to negotiate, uh, no good's going to come out of it, guaranteed. Uh, and I think right now we have a terrible situation in our country where we have a polarized situation where uh, Senator McConnell has come out and said, whatever Biden wants, we're going to be against. Uh, that's something Specter would absolutely find abhorrent. Um, that's not for the best interests of our country, and it's not for the best interests of the world. Uh, no matter what our opinions are, if we can't sit down and talk, if we have a uh, pre-existing idea not to negotiate, then no good will come out of it. And I think what the book does is show so, so many different areas where if you are open to what's best for the nation, if you're open to what's best for your constituents as opposed to what's best for your party, that good things could happen. So how did these meetings with Yasser Arafat affect uh, Senator Specter's career? Well, that's the interesting thing, because, oh, excuse me, because often 
Um, Spector's career would be affected by the decisions he made, and often not for the benefit of Spector, but sometimes for the benefit of our country. Um, meeting with him, obviously, uh, would anger some people, some people in either party, but Spector didn't consider that. I mean, if you look through his career, he received death threats so many times that it almost became a common occurrence. So. Specter, unlike a lot of the politicians we have today, was focused on issue and not on what team he was on or what the reaction would be. Uh, I think he would always say that um, the constituents come first. He would actually visit every county. Uh, he made it a point to go to every single county in, uh, in the Commonwealth every year so as to listen to who the people he believed he represented. So I don't think he cared, uh, really cared about what reaction was. Another figure that he met with was Saddam Hussein. You have a photo of him in the book with, uh, with Saddam. Uh, how, did, uh, how did that come about? Uh, again, even though Saddam Hussein is, we all know who he is, Spectre believed that any conversation with anyone was worthwhile. Um, sometimes they don't work out. The interesting story about Saddam Hussein is when they met, um, Hussein uh, insisted that uh, he be armed in meetings with Spectre, and Spectre says, what do you need to gun? I'm not going to come after you. And there was actually negotiation on this, but he insisted on meeting with Spectre with his pistol. And in the picture, you could actually see Hussein uh, with arms, with Spectre uh, standing right next to him, which was kind of absurd. So is there a record of these meetings? Did he have a note taker or somebody there to keep oh, yeah. track of what they were talking about? Often these meetings occur in the Senate record. Um, Specter was very good about putting in the Senate record exactly what he was doing, where he was going, and um, what conversations took place. That's why writing the book was easy, because he was such a good keeper of information. Whereas, what types of things did they talk about? Was it mostly policy things, or were there informalities? Uh you know, you talk informalities, for example, when he met with Castro, okay? Um, what I think Spectre realized is that you have to understand the relationship with a person. You've got to sit down and talk to them as people first. And their conversation uh, went about what Joan Spectre actually uh, liked to drink best, which was um, Havana rum. So uh, in the middle of one of their meetings, um, Castro sent out one of his people, came back with a beautiful bottle of her Havana rum. And that's the kind of, it's talking to people. I, I can't stress that enough because that is throughout what his career was, is having negotiation and talking. Uh, I keep on coming back to it, but it's so important now because when you have a situation where people don't talk, there's no chance of negotiation, there's no chance of a better good. And that was his philosophy uh, throughout, whether you're talking to someone who's obviously um, a strange individual like Saddam Hussein, or a dangerous individual with a dangerous history such as Arafat or the Assad family, whoever it may be, if you have a dialogue with someone, there is always a chance of working something out for the best of the nation. And this is something we don't have now. And that's why I think this book is especially relevant right now, because it was a philosophy of policy over party, discussion and negotiation over animus. And that's something we need now. Um, I always think of what would all inspector think of what's going on now, and I think he would be absolutely horrified. Now, were these types of meetings with foreign leaders normal for senators, or was it just unique to Arlen Specter? No. Um, if anything, he received a lot of um, blowback from his party and other senators, like, who do you think you are going to meet with all these people? And um, he didn't care. He called it senatorial di uh, international diplomacy. And he would go. And that's what he would do. And he, the answer would be, if I come back with an idea, it's an idea we didn't have before. If I come back with a relationship, it's a relationship we didn't have before. When he went to meet Castro, um, he believed that a relationship with Castro was far better than the blockade that we have had for so long on uh, trade with that nation. And he came back to the Senate and put it forward, and it didn't go anywhere. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But if you never have the, this dialogue, you guarantee, you guarantee failure. When did he meet with Fidel Castro? Oh, many times. Um, 
One of the better meetings he had, of course, was uh, concerning the Kennedy assassination. Um, I'm sure everyone who knows anything about Specter knows this, but of course I'll repeat it. Specter was a young lawyer from the district attorney's office with a good history, and he was selected to be on the Warren Commission. Uh, his particular area was to trace the wounds and how they were caused. And he came up with the single bullet, as he would put it, conclusion, not theory, that one bullet injured Kennedy in the neck, went into Connolly. Another bullet injured Kennedy in the head, the awful shot we've all seen, and one bullet missed, the single bullet being the one that hit Kennedy and Connolly. But there are those who say it's a conspiracy, and there are those who say that um, Lee Harvey Oswald was a pawn of the Cubans. Now, there's something to be said about that, because he was a, uh, a strong proponent of Cuba, and maybe many don't know, but we were trying to assassinate Castro many different ways, uh, ridiculous ways, uh, beard dust, um, exploding cigars. I'm not making this stuff up. You can't make stuff up like this. Um, tr booby trapping treasure uh, near Cuba under the water because they knew he liked to scuba dive. Of course, none of these things worked. But Castro was aware we were trying to kill him, obviously, and it stated once that if you know, this doesn't stop, there's going to be a reaction, and he, it was a threat. So there's people who believe that uh, Castro was somehow involved in influencing Oswald or somehow involved with the Kennedy assassination. So one of the more interesting conversations they had, Castro and um, Spectre, which is in the book, it concerns, was Castro involved? in it, and Castro turned to Spectre and said, listen, I'm not crazy. If I was behind the assassination and they found out about it, I'd be wiped off the planet. So no, I wasn't involved. Um, and at that point, um, they were convinced, the uh, Spectre and his family also were, they were convinced that Castro was telling the truth at the time. So those are the kind of conversations. Obviously, they talked about um, the state of affairs between the both nations and cooperation with the drug trade. So he, he was trying to bring Castro into the world community. And he brought that idea to uh, the Senate, and it was rejected. Now, uh, you mentioned in the book that, that Arlen Specter asked Fidel Castro about being on the receiving end of some of these uh, assassination uh, attempts. So what did he say? I think along the lines of something was, that's my hobby, uh, avoiding uh, all these uh, death uh, attempts against me. And there were dozens. Actually, um, a lot of people don't know this, but it was called Operation Amlash. Uh, when Kennedy was, the day Kennedy was assassinated, we had a individual in Cuba who was planned to give a poison pen, again, crazy stuff, right? A poison pen to a Castro that he would touch and would kill him. Uh, word came in that Kennedy was assassinated, and the CIA called off Operation Amlash the very day of Kennedy's assassination. Now, uh, it was, as you were doing this research, did you discover any foreign leaders that you were surprised that Arlen Specter met with? Uh, no, because he met with he met with practically everyone. Uh, some of the stories that uh, I didn't do, he, he met with uh, Prime Minister um, of India before she was assassinated the very day, and that's something I like to follow up. But he would meet with everyone. The fact that he had a relationship with, um, with uh, Arafat did surprise me, in light of his reluctance to even talk to him because of Arafat's history. But that was, to me, the most surprising and the most revealing relationship. What did presidents think of the senator going off and meeting with these leaders? Uh, that he was circumventing what they're supposed to do, that he was interfering with what their policy was. Uh, he was, Senator Specter was the kind of guy that really didn't care. Um, he thought he was doing the right thing. And he would, despite what a president may want, uh, do what he thought was best. Did you ever meet Arlen Specter? Yeah, um, I have a, uh, my favorite story of his is uh, he would call me up a lot, um, and uh, the decision came in on um, Obamacare, 
And it was shocking to me because I didn't expect the Chief Justice to um, vote the way he did and uphold the constitutionality of it. So I got a call, you know, you got the senators on the line for you. So I said, oh, yeah, okay. And he gets on the line, and I'll do an invitation. And he goes, Irvin, you want to know what happened? And I go, yeah, what happened? He goes, uh, and I, I'll stop the invitation. But he said that Scalia was coming in to Roberts constantly, pressuring him, pressuring him to vote against constitutionality. And Roberts uh, is chief justice. And what Scalia did is he pushed Roberts too far. Because you don't tell the Chief Justice what to do. The Chief Justice tells you what to do. And this is what Spector told me. And of course, he, he you know, knows all these folks because he was involved in um, the confirmation of many of them. So I said to him, I said, I can't believe we have health care in the United States of America because of ego. And he said to me, well, he puts on his pants one leg at a time like any other man. And I thought that was such a great story. Because here is one of the most important decisions in American jurisprudence, and it was determined, just like we do all things, ego, relationships. Now, you mentioned that uh, the Arlen Specter Center has a replica of his office. Yeah. Uh, why did you decide to do that there? Well, originally, he was to have an office in the center, so we wanted to make him comfortable, but unfortunately he passed on due to the numerous problems he had with cancer. And at that point we decided to recreate it to give a sense of who the man was. And when you walk into the office and you see those photos, you understand just how important he was. One of the most important photos is actually not a photo, it's a, um, a cartoon by Tony Off, who did the famous political cartoons. And he has a picture of, one, of a cliff, uh, a ravine. And on one side, you got Democrats, and on the other side, you have Republicans. And there's Specter with one foot on both sides, being pulled by a donkey and being pulled by an elephant. And the caption is, uh, you know, being pulled by both sides, whatever it may be. But I always interpret it as he was always in the middle of every important event over the last 30 years. And whether it was Iran-Contra, which I hope we'll get into, the Clinton um, impeachment, uh, the selection of Bork, the selection of Justice Thomas, stem cell research, LBT, uh, TT, I always mess that up, rights. Um, he was in the middle of it. We have so many senators today who make speeches and don't even pass a single law. We have so many senators get on different TV shows, whether it's CNN or Fox or whatever it may be, and pontificate, but don't pass a single law. Specter passed law after law after law that were groundbreaking, idea after idea that were groundbreaking. He was in the middle of some of the most important things, was decisions or sponsoring legislation or holding hearings. And I didn't even know the man. I'm a New Yorker. I didn't know him. And the more I did research on what he did and see what we have today, uh, the more I became impressed. He mentioned several times in the book that he had a hideaway office. Was that yeah. in his Senate chambers or was it somewhere else? Oh, yeah. They have in Washington because they don't want to be bothered. So they have a, a office they hide away in. And actually, I believe that's the one that he had the poster of um, Clinton and uh, Arafat together where Arafat uh, met with uh, Specter. Now, if you went into the hideaway office, uh, what would be different there than a main office? You know, I never went, so I can't tell you. But I would imagine is that it kept you safe from um, your constituents. That's probably the best, easiest thing to say. Now, in addition to meeting world leaders, he was also involved, as you say, in, in a lot of different other events. Uh, Robert Bork was nominated in late 1980s for a Supreme Court justice position. Uh, what was uh, Arlen Specter's role with that? Pivotal. Um, Specter was a Republican, and he had promised President um, Reagan that he would back any uh, Supreme Court justice that he was going to put up. The court was changing. We have to understand that. Um, the Warren Court, which was groundbreaking, um, all the, uh, whether it's Fourth Amendment, First Amendment, uh, Fifth Amendment laws, civil rights laws, um, the list is endless of what the Warren Court did under Earl Warren, um, all very on the uh, liberal side, uh, in expanding civil rights and so forth. Warren had died, the court was changing. Um, people on the conservative side um, were upset with the court for many different reasons and wanted a conservative justice. So they picked Robert Bork. 
Uh, Robert Bork, to give a little idea of who he was, uh, when Nixon was president, um, Nixon, obviously we know about Watergate, the key issue in Watergate were the tapes. And Archibald Cox was the special investigator who was prosecuting the case against Nixon for various different um, crimes that he committed as president of the United States. It was discovered during the hearings that the White House was actually wired, that all these conversations uh, concerning all these different uh, acts were actually on tape. Nixon would not give up the tapes. Archibald Cox demanded those tapes. So Nixon wanted Archibald Cox fired. And he couldn't do it, but the attorney general could. So he went to the attorney general at the time, and he says, I want you to fire Archibald Cox. The attorney general said no. Nixon pressured him. The attorney general resigned. This is all on a Saturday night. Next, we have the deputy attorney general right after that, same day, same night. I want you to fire Archibald Cox. No. You have to. No. He resigned. Two attorney generals down. Third one in line was Robert Bork. Nixon, same conversation. Robert Bork said yes and fired Archibald Cox. And it's known as the Saturday Night Massacre, where you had two attorney generals and a special prosecutor all uh, uh, lost positions in one night. So Bork was not a favorite with the Democrats. Uh, Bork was very conservative on many issues. And Specter decided that he was going to oppose the nomination. Uh, this was unheard of. It was a Republican going against the president. But Specter believed that Bork was not the right person for the job, that his um, demeanor and his philosophy was not proper for the um, Supreme Court of the United States or the future of America judicially. So he opposed it. And his opposition, there was no question, led to Bork being turned down. Uh, there's been very few uh, confirmations that went south in our history, and that is one of them. And he received a tremendous amount of blowback. Um, he received uh, from a congressman the following letter. Dear Arl Inspector, go to hell. That was the letter. Um, from another congressman, it stated to him, uh, Arlen, it's hunting season in our county. I really recommend that you don't come because you may not make it out. Uh, thousands of phone calls, death threats were the reaction to this, but Specter believed what he did was right. And he turned down Bork in the Judiciary Committee. His vote led, many will absolutely agree, to the ultimate uh, denial of Robert Bork as, as a seat. So that is, to me, one of the first really strong examples of policy over party. Uh, he received tremendous amount of pressure, threats. You'll be a dead duck in the next election, said James Clymer, who was head of the conservative um, caucus, calling him a Benedict Arnold. Uh, the, the letter that was sent, which is in the book, because I didn't want to just quote it, I actually put it in there like a photo because it's written in capitals, single space. It looks like one of those letters that, God forbid, you would get that scare the heck out of you. This is the kind of things that he got, but he went against it, and Bork was, uh, not, um, was not confirmed. Now you mentioned the letter that where he's told to go to hell. You also include the letter that uh, Arlen Specter sent back to that person. What, what was Specter's response? Specter's response was something along the line of um, he'll, he'll cherish <laughs> this letter always, and it just shows the level of intellectual uh, height that the opposition has taken. Um, it really just showed, like, I don't care. You can threaten me all you want. I'm going to do what I think is right. Now, you mentioned that uh, Arlen Specter uh, disagreed with Bork's philosophy. W what were those disagreements? The disagreement has to do with um, Bork was an originalist, um, and so to give some background so the audience know who I am, I teach uh, con law over at Jefferson Constitutional Law, and I also was an attorney for many years, so I'm fairly familiar with the Constitution. Originalists believe that you interpret the Constitution as to what the Founding Fathers meant when they wrote it. Um, 
Specter believe that the Constitution has to respond to the times that we live in, and not 200 and some odd years ago for uh, rich white men who wrote it. Uh, I always found the originalists, which Scalia was one, and Bork, uh, Scalia was one, and Bork would have been one, to be so confounding because there wasn't one uh, founding father who wrote it. There are dozens that contributed to it. Uh, the Constitution is a hodgepodge of all different people with different ideas and different negotiations and different uh, compromises. Uh, there's even mistakes in the Constitution. Um, First Amendment, Congress shall pass no law. It refers to infringing on religion and free speech. Well, how about the president? They kind of left them out of that one. Or how about the courts? They kind of left them out of that. We've assumed since then that that's what the Congress meant. Uh, the Fourth Amendment is actually the wrong Fourth Amendment. They passed one um, by, by committee vote, and the printer put the wrong one in, and it was too late to change it. So when you look at an originalist point of view, how could you, have an, how could you know what they thought? There were so many of them with different thoughts. And Specter thought that that point of view, he could not um, have somebody on the court with that, even though he made the promise to Reagan that he would confirm anybody. How was the, the Bork nomination process uh, different from what came before? The Bork nomination process, to me, is a, um, a watershed, and I cover that in the book. Uh, it made politics the spectacle that it is today. Uh, it always was something, but it became a TV event. Uh, with 24-hour news stations, Turner Broadcasting started, CNN at that point, it became a contest. It wasn't a matter of politics or boring policy. What it became is a contest between parties. Um, Gregory Peck actually put out a commercial which was sponsored by the people who created um, All in the Family, and it attacked Bork on national TV, which was really unusual. That never happened before that you'd have a Supreme Court nomination become the subject of a commercial saying all these terrible things that would happen. It became a war. Uh, between both sides. Um, and this spectacle uh, did not go unnoticed in the cultural wars. And that spectacle, what happened in Bork, is determined exactly what happened in Clarence Thomas, because the spectacle that began with Bork became a show in, in the Clarence Thomas hearings. And later on, as we've seen with Kavanaugh, this has become top TV, reality television, uh, that isn't it's about law policy, but about who do we like, not like, who do we vote for, um, who was voted off the island almost. That came with Bork. Well, let's talk about the Clarence Thomas uh, mm -hmm. hearings. Uh, how long after the Bork hearings did that take place? Uh, it, it was several years later. Um, Justice Kennedy, excuse me, Justice Marshall was going to leave the court. Thurgood Marshall was the first African-American to be on the court, and very liberal. He was a civil rights giant, as uh, we all know. Uh, and he, has, he was old and sick. And this was under the George Bush senior uh, administration. And they decided that they had to have another African-American. Now, George Bush senior said he picked not because of color, because he was the most qualified person out there, which the remark is it just— it challenges credibility to the greatest degree because Clarence Thomas was clearly not the most qualified person. He even admitted it in a quote later. Uh, he had served a year and a half as a circuit court judge. He had worked for this, um, the Civil Rights Commission, uh, excuse me, EEOC. He was not the most qualified person. He was picked because he was African American and he was a Republican. And it would go down well to replace Marshall um, with somebody. Um, one of my favorite quotes, which is in the book, is from Thurgood Marshall, when they said, well, what do you think about race coming into it? And he said, it really doesn't matter the color of the man. He says, a snake is a snake, whether they're white or black. And that's how he viewed Clarence Thomas. So Clarence Thomas was picked because of his color. There's no doubt about it, and not his qualifications. Uh, at this point, um, the culture war was, ra was running hot. Um, he was going to be nominated, and it's, it's, it's a long story that we cover in the book, I cover in the book, but in the middle of this process, Anita Hill um, makes allegations. Initially, she didn't want to, and she was outed by um, 
the press who she had gone to that Clarence Thomas had made uh, remarks to her which were inappropriate. He hadn't touched her or any along those lines, but the remarks were inappropriate. That made its way to the Judiciary Committee, and that became a circus, um, with each side demonizing each other side, uh, and all inspector became in the middle of it because he had questioned Anita Hill. That was his job when she testified uh, in front of the uh, Judiciary Committee. Why was Specter the one who questioned her? Specter was picked by the Republicans. Um, they manipulated him into doing it. Uh, they called him on the phone, and uh, this is really a product of uh, Senator Jack Danforth, who was um, never on the Judiciary Committee, but pulling strings behind the scenes for the Republican Party. And they decided that Specter owed them a favor after Bork and that Specter is probably the most talented cross-examiner in the Senate because of his experience as a prosecutor. And they thought if it came from Specter that it would be the most effective way of neutralizing Anita Hill. Uh, they played on his ego. Um, they said, we'll hire a private um, attorney to do the questioning if you don't. So Specter giving in to various different pressures. Also, he was running for free uh, re-election and promised that um, he would not be opposed as strongly if he cooperated. So he became the questioner of Anita Hill. Now, there you have a photo in the book of uh, Arlen Specter with Clarence Thomas. Yeah. Uh, what are the circumstances around that photo? Yeah, this uh, I, I really discovered something that amazed me. You know, when you do research, uh, you find things out so that you never even thought existed. Uh, when Thomas was being considered, uh, Specter's on the Judiciary Committee, it is typical to interview the, um, the applicant in your office. So he invited Clarence Thomas in. And his staff, uh, Tom Dudar and I believe Richard Heckling, were his main attorneys. And he asked him, I want you to do a deep dive on Clarence Thomas and what his points of view are on things, because I want to have a good discussion with him. And remember, he's only been a judge for a year and a half. He really hasn't accomplished much. So it wasn't that hard to find out what his opinions or what written opinions he had. And Specter was concerned about his opinions on affirmative action. Specter was very strong on affirmative action. Uh, he had heard and seen speeches where Thomas sort of waffled on it, and he wanted to know where he stood on it. So he called him in his office and he asked him about the Metro case. The Metro case had to deal with um, giving um, women a, um, a preferential um, opportunity to get a license for television stations over men because there wasn't many women in broadcasting. So he asked him about Metro and he said, um, I'm not against it. Whatever the court says, you know, I'm for it. And that was it. There was no controversy. Metro is very strong for affirmative action. All good, right? So now, the day of the vote, the day of the vote of the Judiciary Committee, the Legal Times, small paper in Washington, comes out and says that Clarence Thomas, as part of a five-judge panel, was the deciding 3-2 vote and wrote the opinion on a case called Lambrecht. And Lambrecht was an affirmative action case, and in that case, it was rumored that Clarence Thomas was strongly against Metro, criticized it completely, and very strongly against affirmative action. So that came out. Now, lawyers out there may not understand. This is the way court cases work. The judges review the papers. They review it. Um, they decide what their opinion. They write an opinion, which is the reasons why they believe they are going to do what they're going to do. It's policy, law, facts, a mixture of all that. But they could write that opinion, and it means nothing until they file the order. An order is a simple paper that says, it's hereby ordered and decreed this day of whatever that the following decision is enacted into law. So it is not an official case until the order. So Clarence Thomas was invited back into Specter's um, office to discuss the Legal Times ar um, article. And According to those two attorneys I told you, work for uh, Specter, it was a very long, very serious meeting. And Specter confronted him and said, did you write an opinion saying what the Legal Times said that you, that you said? And he said, no. Now, here's the cute part about it. 
because it's not an opinion until the order is signed. So he wasn't lying, but he was lying. He left the office and Spector was convinced. It later came out that that opinion sat on his desk when he realized that he, Clarence Thomas, that he was going to be considered as a Supreme Court justice. He, he knew that this would be controversial, so he decided not to sign that order until he was confirmed. And after he was confirmed, Thomas was actually stepped down for an hour as Supreme Court justice, became a temporary circuit court judge, signed the order, made it into law, went back to the Supreme Court. Specter did not know, and he believed he believed Clarence Thomas when he spoke to him. And when I asked his assistants, the legal assistants, would this have made a difference in whether or not he was confirmed by Specter, who voted for confirmation, they said, we don't know, probably not, but we can guarantee you this. He would have cross-examined him on it in front of the nation. And if the nation had heard about his not being totally upfront about his, uh, his opinions and what his true beliefs were on affirmative action, it may have made a difference. Now, there are many prominent figures in this book with their connection to Arlen Specter. And in this chapter, you talk about somebody who's not quite as prominent, uh, people may not know about, Floyd Brown. Who is Floyd Brown? Oh, boy. Floyd Brown is probably the topic of my next book, if I get around to writing it. Floyd Brown is a person behind the scenes who orchestrates a lot of important things. Um, the Willie Horton ad, um, Floyd Brown. Uh, if those of you don't remember it, uh, when Governor Dukakis was running for president, uh, he um, had, as governor of Massachusetts, had a program where certain prisoners could get out oh, if they behaved themselves for a weekend with their family. Mm -hmm. One of those prisoners was Willie Horton. Uh, and during one of the times he was out, he murdered somebody else. So Floyd Brown, who was an operative for the Republican Party, for, I believe it was George Bush Sr. running against Dukakis, uh, they put together an ad uh, all about this. And it was very clear from the ad that they were appealing to the racial, racist elements of some people in the, Dem of the Republican Party. Uh, it showed Floyd Brown, and it was the clear trope of the black man uh, being dangerous. And that's not just me saying it. Um, Republican operatives who uh, reviewed this later said we were clearly appealing to a certain person out there in the South who would find this type of ad extremely appealing. Um, and I think one of the quotes that makes me sick in the book is, is we can't and it, we can't say N-word, N-word, N-word anymore because that doesn't float. So what we have to do is find the right images so that we put it out there without saying it. And that was the Willie Horton ad. The Willie Horton ad is a stain on, on American uh, politics as far as I'm concerned. It was a clear racist ad. That's Floyd Brown. Uh, Floyd Brown, um, at this point, during the Clarence Thomas hearings, had learned from the Bork hearings, had learned from the Gregory Peck um, commercial that they have to become aggressive. So what they did is they created ads attacking the uh, reputations, personally and professionally, of Democrats who'd be important in the vote. And one of the uh, people they targeted was Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy had his own problems with Chappaquiddick. Uh, where a young lady died uh, when she was in his car and he swam away and got away with it. Uh, they were going to, that was the feature of the commercial. Alan Simpson um, had possible scandals with um, banking problems at that time. That was highlighted. And Joe Biden, who was on the committee, President Biden now, um, he, in more naive days, uh, was accused of um, plagiarizing during one of his speeches when he was running for president back in the 80s. So these ads went on personal attacks against these senators so as to neutralize them. Also behind the scenes, Floyd Brown was um, instrumental in, um, I'll just, it's the, the pube affidavit, which was a fiction that was created to say that Anita Hill, uh, when she was a law professor, put pubic hairs 
on certain papers that she returned to her um, students. That was an absolute fiction that was created, and he was also involved in that. So Floyd Brown later went on to uh, sponsor Citizens United, which is the decision of Citizens United brought the case uh, that went up to the Supreme Court, which has essentially affected politics forever in this nation um, regarding funding by corporations. So behind the scenes, Floyd Brown is the person who's been pulling a lot of strings that we don't know about, but one of the more influential people on the, uh, on the right side of politics. Now, another figure you mentioned along with Floyd Brown was Lee Atwater. Who is he? Yeah, Lee Atwater was the one who gave the quote that I told you about, you know, you, you, can, you can't say those words anymore, but what you do is you're clever enough to give those uh, dog whistles out there that uh, people who want to hear what they want to hear regarding racism hear it, and you could always say, hey, I didn't say that, and uh, have uh, deniability. So Atwater was also one of the people behind the scenes as well. Now, one of the photos in the book uh, shows uh, then-Senator Joe Biden and Arlen Specter riding on Amtrak together. Uh, wh what do you learn about them from that photo? Yeah, um, there's so much to learn from that. Um, Biden, the Democrat. Uh, Specter, the Republican. Uh, and this is how they met, really, for the first time personally. Uh, Biden would take the train. We all know it's famous. You know, he takes the train home from Washington to be with his family in Delaware. But Specter would do the same thing to be at home with his family in uh, Pennsylvania. So the train is being held up, um, and Biden's sitting on a train. Why is it being held up? And uh, the conductor says, "Well, the reason why is that this uh, new senator, Specter." Uh, called in and said, hold the train for him. And he goes, he's, he's been a senator like for like a short period of time. Who the heck is he to hold up the train? And that's how they met. And they would sit next to each other for years. And they would debate policy. They would um, talk about the law. they talk about their family. And they developed a relationship, which became critical to the United States when we deal with the, uh, the economic crisis later on. Biden and, and Specter became close friends. Um, when Biden was accused of plagiarism, Specter, who was on the other side, still wrote him a note, uh, told him he was supporting him, and Biden wrote him a beautiful note back, handwritten, which is in the book, about how much he appreciates the support he has from his good friend. Uh, he was there for him. It didn't matter that he was a Democrat and Specter was a Republican. What matters is there was a relationship between the two men. And as I've kept on saying, you know, at the beginning of this interview, relationships are so important, and not demonizing the other person is so important in politics. Later on, when our country had that terrible crisis because of the housing bubble burst, um, Obama walked into a terrible situation. Um, the world was on a precipice economically. Uh, value of the stock market went in half. Uh, foreclosures of homes were, all, were, were um, couldn't even count how many there were. People's uh, savings were being depleted. Uh, financial institutions were closing. Uh, there were, we were on the precipice of it. And at that point, uh, Obama said, we have to pass a unprecedented stimulus package, much like Biden recently did with COVID, in order to save our country and save the world economically. The problem was that although Congress was Democrat and although Senate was Democrat, it was several votes short of beating the filibuster. So let me explain what that is, because that's relevant right now. If you bring up a law, even if, you're, uh, if, if the majority brings up a law in the Senate, the minority can challenge it being voted upon by a thing called a filibuster which is you continue to delay and delay through talking, so a vote never happens. The only way you can beat a filibuster is by a word called a cloture. A cloture is you need 60 votes, 60 votes, uh, to defeat a filibuster and bring the bill finally to be voted on. The stimulus would not have passed because the Republicans stated very clearly, if Obama's for it, we're against it. Same stuff they're doing now with McConnell. If Biden's for it, they're against it. Despite the fact 
that we had unprecedented unemployment, despite the fact that world economies were teetering, despite the fact that we had huge organizations going bankrupt, Republicans made it very clear, if Obama's for it, we're against it. And they would not vote for the stimulus and would filibuster it. Joe Biden, the Democrat, the vice president at the time, came to his friend and said, it is best for the country we do this. You have to vote for cloture and defeat the filibuster. Specter knew that if he went against his party on this, this would destroy him. Uh, Biden lobbied him, but it was Specter who had to make a decision. And he sat with his family, his son Shannon, and his political advisors to determine what he was going to do. And he said, it is best for the country, and I know that it will destroy me in the party, and it will destroy my political career, but I have to do this. And he gave um, a quote, he said, I think it's from Lincoln, that to vote your conscience, your conscience 90 percent of the time, um, sometimes you have to vote the other way. But his voting the other way, like for Thomas and things like that, gave him the ability to vote his conscience this time. And he voted for cloture, and he voted for the stimulus. The stimulus came in. Um, as I discuss in the book, uh, its success is debated as to how successful it was. But when Obama left office, unemployment was way down. Our country's economy was strong. And there's many who will say that Specter's vote that day saved the country, if not saved the economic system. Uh, but he was dead as a, as a Republican. It was over, because that was one step f too far. Uh, he had gone against party. Uh, he had, was brave enough. And I think this is extremely relevant now, when we've had Liz Cheney thrown out of her leadership position because she said, we have to tell the truth. She gambled her position and her power because she knew she was right. Specter gambled his complete career because he knew he was right and it had to be done. And loyalty to party is nowhere as important as loyalty to the nation and loyalty to the constituents. So the story of the stimulus is a story of relationship between two men, Biden convincing Specter and Specter having the strength of character to do what was right. In the 1980s, uh, during the uh, Ronald Reagan presidency, one of the big scandals was Iran-Contra. Uh, in the book, you have a photograph of President Reagan addressing the uh, uh, Republican caucus, and Senator Specter is standing up talking to Reagan. Uh, what was that photograph about? This is during Cold War, and I know it seems uh, so long ago um, that we had so much problems with the Russians where they seem to be our closest friends over the last four years. I said that sarcastically. But in any event, it was the Cold War. And Nicaragua was a um, country that was run by a dictatorship, but he was our dictator. He was thrown out of um, office, rightfully so, and replaced by um, the Sandinistas who were communist. Reagan thought that a communist stronghold in Central America would be dangerous to the United States of America, and through the CIA formed um, a group called the Contras, whose chief um, idea was to get rid of the Sandinistas. They're hardly a democratic group. Uh, we funded the, Sa the Contras, and when it was initially we did this, Specter, the moderate, the guy in the middle, agreed. But it was soon revealed that these people were a disorganized bunch of mostly drug dealers and that we were improperly doing what we, we shouldn't be doing in, in that nation. So he told Reagan, I will no longer support funding. And his being in the middle brought the rest of the Republican Party over. And there was enough votes to deny funding. That didn't stop Reagan and the CIA and Oliver North, who was behind all this with Reagan. And they continued to fund the, the uh, Contras. When that was discovered, the Senate and Congress passed the Boland Amendment, saying, you can't do that. We will not tolerate that. So what the Reagan administration did is ignored Boland one and continued to. And the Senate then passed the second Boland Amendment, which was stronger and more specific, and very strongly said, you cannot fund the Contras. 
Um, Reagan went specifically to Specter to try to convince him not to go for Boland too and to support um, the funding of the Contras, and Specter said no. And with that no, that went the rest of the Republican Party, or enough votes to the Republican Party to, def to put out the Boland's Amendment and prohibit it. That did not stop the Reagan administration. Uh, what most people don't know, Iran Contra is one of the biggest um, real conspiracies we've had in this nation. Uh, when I teach it at Jefferson, the conspiracy theories class, there are nine separate ways that the, the uh, Reagan administration went against the law, which most Americans don't know. So to find money for the Contras, to find money, what this country did is sell weapons through a straw man, which was Israel, to Iran in order so that they continue their war against Iraq, which we were funding Iraq on the other side. So we were essentially funding Iran and Iraq in the war against each other. And Iran was our enemy at the time. Iran was, this is not too long after the hostages were taken. Um, this was not, this was during the time the death to, to America marches were taking place. Iran was an enemy of the United States who sponsored terrorism all over the world. But yet we sold them weapons in their battle against Iraq. We took the money and funneled it to the Contras. Illegally, secretly, was done. That is something that came out later. Um, when further funding was needed for the Contras, because they just ate up that money, the Contras started to sell cocaine in the United States of America um, through the form of crack. The CIA was knowledgeable that this was happening and did nothing. The crack crisis in the United States was something that has destroyed many, many, many families, many, many communities. And that was part of all this, um, in an unbelievably misguided um, attempt by the Reagan administration to fund these Contras, who were ultimately completely unsuccessful, which was no surprise. Um, Specter, continuing with his involvement in this, held hearings on the crack issue that I told you about. Um, Specter also created the Office of the Inspector General, which we hear about a lot now, which is responsible for overseeing the CIA independently. And their reports have become very much part of our political process. That office was created by Senator Specter in response to the CIA's misdoings, which were numerous under Reagan administration. Well, that will have to be the last word. Uh, Evan Edward Lane is the author of Arlen Specter, Scandals, Conspiracies, and Crisis in Focus. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details.